Son, Lord of Mine. And the reason why is that he came to the college to get arrested. And uh, I'm just saying, you know, I learned how to tell God I am my mother. And uh, also that God came to let me be arrested. Oh, maybe something I can get to know better. And um, I ran up to him and I said, oh, I love you, Lily. And the guy's like, can I do an interview with you? Is he going to be okay? City on the Upper Deck. He was in Soho, and he said, "Ring a bell, and I'll toss the keys out the window." <laughs> and I ran up to him, and I ran up, and she was sick at the time. She was just like in bed, and this huge wave was lost with the wind coming from her head. And we talked for a long time. But then this evening, mm -hmm. I asked her. I got this idea that we all live by. Even in clinical seminars, I know I like my professors at Columbia. But looking back, it was very clear how you were supposed to think and what you were supposed to know. Mm -hmm. It was all the syllabus that was given to you by the approach, by the textbook. But wouldn't you just be better thinking about music as not so much what you're supposed to know? Because I 
gave their life for the wonderful life that Sarah was living. I can't imagine 30 years of that kind of matter going on here. <laughs> 30 more years of that. But we can move on. Sorry for that. <laughs> <coughs> and um, we must have learned to hear things in a different way, to get through it. Because the identity had to be somehow in your mind. So I, it's very profound that I'm here, extremely profound, and even more so my children are here. <laughs> so I, I, I wanted to say that how profound it is to me that I also am a student of this. So thank you so much. Thank you. 
four minutes. Okay. I think um, we have to control what is possible, but what is even common. Um, that was so rich, and now I'm even more moved. When, you, when you said at your last lecture, you oh. really knew my sense of the of the desert. So um, I open it up with any of the questions or comments you might have. I, I just want to comment. I can remember um, my training as a linguist, the topical linguist, and the words and the everyone who was going through graduate programs. It was the process of of suppressing one's enthusiasm. a bit of, of the intuition or to make sure that people know what they're supposed to know. But it could hurt you if you just get it out of other people. Yeah, and also I wouldn't say that any traditional procurers are under any other kind of illusion that, that uh, they obviously understand the kind of authoritative things that they are trying to say. They can just mean people who are living in the wisdom. And reason a, a lot of really good people full of passion and care.
because uh, it became a clear influence on a couple of pieces that I'll be presenting, pieces of my own, uh, that I'll be presenting later on in the talk. So the basic topic today is my experience as a composer in revising early musical practices, musicians simply being influenced by the music, um, and trying to go deeper into the way music was thought of at the time, say in the Middle Ages and Renaissance in particular. So that includes um, music theory and musical practices more broadly. Um, I found that doing this has given me a far better grasp as a composer and improviser and musician in general of melody and harmony, which are two main concerns for a composer, especially young ones. Um, again, this is not simply, what I do is not simply, you know, period composition. I'm not really trying to emulate a particular style, a particular era. Um, I'm trying to go deeper and find sort of deeper values in uh, older music and older repertoires, older practices, older ways of thinking. And I found it very useful. Modern composition, um, the sort of modern world of composition does not offer, I think, clear methods for composing. Um, the history of composition, I don't know, the past 100 years has been kind of chaotic, I feel. Um, you know, especially in like the modernist period, sort of every composer has their own theories on their own music, and sometimes they even publish treatises on you know, explaining their theories. It became extremely individualized, maybe too extreme, and eventually what happened in the world of academia is serialism really took over, and it sort of it became the opposite, where you sort of had to write serial music at a certain point, which is, that's no longer the case, I don't think it's been the case for maybe 20 years now, uh, but still pretty recent enough to you know, speak to a older composition faculty that was their experience. Often they grew up learning composition in that kind of context. So only sort of serial music was considered you know, academic music, something you could write. Um, and like I said, it's no longer the case now, but there's sort of, you can do anything now, and that's that can be freeing and great, but it's also a bit confusing, especially for a young composition student, like, what do I do? You know? um, so that's part of the challenge for a modern composer. And I'm finding that looking back in history, um, particularly through a repertoire that I just love, first of all, okay, why is music like this? Why do I like it so much? Um, I look back and I find out you know, the way they thought about music was very different. The way they taught music was very different from modern classical music. And so that was a very much like a surprise, and I, like I said, found these practices and ways of thinking to be extremely beneficial and maybe they could be beneficial for other composers too. So, oh, I forgot to turn this on. Anyways, I'm gonna give you some personal background about myself. This is sort of, this talk is largely about sort of my own journey as a composer. So I've been composing, I guess studying composition officially for like about 10 years now. Um, just writing music a little longer than that on my own. Um, so I began playing the guitar at age 10 about and playing in rock and blues and jazz. And I didn't really encounter classical music until I was about in high school, so many years later. Um, I began to read music early on. I had teachers who would teach me things like that and teach me music theory. Um, but what I also had as part of my upbringing musically was a lot of uh, sort of more oral musical experiences of you know, learning things by ear. Um, engaging in improvisation, which is something I'm, I've since learned that many classical musicians don't engage with and are not taught to do. And I think that's a, a real shame. And when I got into classical music, it was largely modern classical music at first. Composers like Stravinsky, Steve Reich, and John Cage, um, with the exception of Bach. It was hard to make Bach when you're learning about classical music. Um, and that's sort of the style of music I began with, you know, more modern 
And so when I got to college, I started doing composition lessons, um, taking classes for guitar lessons and all that. And I was beginning to write music that way on a more modern side, but I was also beginning to learn about classical music from other eras via like, music theory classes, ear training classes, uh, class piano, music history. I was exposed to all this repertoire from many different centuries, 18th century music, Renaissance music, medieval music, and I really began to fall more in love with that music than the modernist kind of music. Um, and so then I was sort of presented with a problem as a composer, you know, what kind of music should I be writing then? I don't really, I'm losing interest in this modernist kind of music, but can I just start writing like, like later kinds of music? Um, when I began composing about 10 years ago, like I said, I could have probably started writing if I, if I wanted to, like Hell Stream style music, and that would have been fine by my teachers. Um, but I think the, there was a bit of a, a vibe in the air or something like that, that still that sort of modernist tendency, sort of historical framework was in play for, you know, you, well, this time period you have to write certain kinds of music. You can't go back and write different kinds of music that, that's already done, you know, in a different era now. I can sympathize with that bit. I, like I said, don't really want to recreate the past, um, but I do think it's largely what to offer. Um, so I kind of struggled with this for a few years, and I was particularly, things started to change when I was, began to uh, be interested in medieval music more directly. I found an album, I think a friend of mine had given me a big collection of classical music albums, and one was an album of Adam de la Hall's music, a French true rare from the uh, 13th century. And the melodic style, in particular, of his chansons was so different than what I'd heard before, and it was really inspiring to me, and it felt like something I could sort of personally engage with. It, it was a very personal connection. And I asked my composition teacher about, you know, what is this? Who is Adam de la Hall? days later he gave me an album of the Ramon de Clavel, if anyone knows that uh, romance, and it was uh, by the Comencius consort, a very energetic ensemble, and I was just blown away by what I heard, and it was so inspiring, and I began to define all the medieval music albums I could, all the troubadour albums and all that, <coughs> and my music began to take on, you know, qualities of that music pretty directly sometimes, and sometimes I would try to write melodies in the style of Adam de la Hall, or sometimes just take his melodies directly using the cantus firming in great harmonies with them. And so my composition style already had begun to move, and I was sort of getting more into a diatonic space rather than sort of a formal or non formal space. feels more like a stable place now. And it was still sort of this tension between sort of this feeling like I should be writing more modern music versus something influenced by older music or music that I just kind of thought sounded better, frankly, or sounded nicer. Um, so I'm gonna jump forward a little bit now to talk about something much more recent that happened just about last year. I was studying with Dr. Margaret Fries over here, and we did some lovely intense studies together, focusing on medieval monody um, to further my interest in sort of studying, you know, what makes what makes these melodies work, what makes a good melody. It's very difficult to learn how to write a good melody. I don't I've never seen anyone teach it in school. You know, I think it's something that really requires a lot of immersion, sort of like becoming fluent in a language. A lot of listening, a lot of practice in doing it, and we get a different sense for it. And so, when we did our intense studies together, uh, we looked at primarily melodies for troubadours and troubadours, uh, because that's what interested me the most, with sort of an aim of using these materials to make new music with, whether that be improvisationally or compositionally. And there's not much of a difference between the two, anyways. Um, so. One of the um, sources that we used to help us out, sort of a method book, was this really great book by um, a woman named Angela Mariani that uh, Dr. Fries had shown me. It's called
called Improvisation and Invencio in the Performance of Minima Musa. And I read that book, and it really, um, it was a fantastic book, so I kept thinking to myself, this could make a great method book for composition, actually. <laughs> I was kind of surprised. And it's because it's a method book for improvisation. <coughs> and improvisation is basically just composition in real time. There's really no difference in terms of the methodology. So some of the things that she pointed out that relate to melody in particular are using existing pieces of models, right, models and new pieces, um, earlier modal theory, and sort of looking at melodic formula, which is partly related to modal theory. Um, so the most clear and direct one is using existing tuning for a model. Right? This is something that I mean, they do in jazz, for instance, often you'll, um, you can learn how to solo and improvise in jazz. You'll learn an entire solo from a recording from another musician. So you get into the style by imitating very directly. Then you might just use pieces of that solo for your own new solo. Very similar idea here. So the leg I just presented was one of many um, songs that we looked at, sang through, you know, talked about. It was much more than just a short, you know, looking at a piece of paper and analyzing. You're really singing through these pieces, getting a sense for them, um, thinking about the um, nature of each one, how they behave. And I then came up with a new tune setting a new poem, say an English poem by Ian Spencer at Tom. And I'm going to sing that in a little bit. I first just want to say a few more things about sort of earlier conceptions of melody, I guess, but particularly modal theory. You know, modal theory be very helpful in a variety of ways, but there are many modal theories, there's not just one. And often in the modern classroom, in the modern theory, we're taught a different sort of modal theory than what the medieval and early Renaissance folks would learn. In modern uh, modal theory, we would basically learn, like, say Dorian is just B to D on the right keys. You know, um, That's a very different conception to how Lowe was thought of in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. First of all, even if you wanted to take a more scalar approach, you would have, you wouldn't just have the right key, you have B flat in addition. And that's a big difference. It may seem like not a big difference, but it can have a lot of implications. It can, be, it can make the mode more flexible. Um, and also, mode in the earlier period, was, especially in the early Middle Ages, had more to do with melodic behavior rather than just a pure sort of a scale, scalar idea. And for an improviser or composer, you, it's extremely beneficial to know how modes, know the behavior, the melodic behavior of modes, rather than just simply knowing a scale. I can just run up and down a scale, that's not very interesting. You know? But knowing how the notes and intervals behave within that scale, that's actually amazing. So I think I'll stop and Sing this song. So again, I we use that lay that I opened with as a sort of model. I took some phrases from it and took this new sonnet and tried to find ways I could incorporate phrases from the lay into this, as well as making up new phrases, thinking about modal theory. So here we go. Like a ship that through the ocean winds, thy conduct of some star doth make her way. When as a storm hath dimmed the trusty guide, out of her force doth wander far astray. So I who star that wont with her bright ray. With clouds is overcast. Who wander now in darkness and dismay? <coughs> Who hidden perils round about me clasp? Yet hope I well that when the storm is past. 
secret sorrow and sad pensive lips. One other thing I'd like to mention about this process and the creation of this tune is that we also wanted to engage in a more, um, like I said, improvisatory nature, which sort of implies a sort of morality to the practice. There are no notes on this page because I've never written down. So part of the process was about creating a melody without notation. And this was something you know, that's well understood since it has occurred often in earlier periods, especially with the religious, much more the oral tradition of music in general. Um, it's not really believed that the troubadours or the troubadours, especially the troubadours, wrote down their own music ever. Um, it's believed to be more of an improvised tradition. So we wanted to engage with that. And as a composer, again, to be able to do that, I think, is a great skill, to not have to rely on pencil and paper, but to be able to have a conception of mode and melody um, the pitch space, to be able to create melodies, or orally, I guess you can also still, not only for a composer, but a musician in general, so I'll get back to the implementation a little more later on. Um, now moving on to the other big area, so, and when I say harmony, I'm largely just talking about counterpoint. I don't really believe that they're different. Um, so, going back to my earlier days as a composer, a composition student, I was having a lot of difficulties with harmony because I didn't really know what was right in a very real sense to do. Um, I would learn some things in theory class, primarily in chordal analysis. Um, we touched upon counterpoint a little bit, but really not much at all. I was not able to take counterpoint classes until this school. Um, they weren't even offered at the first school I was at previously, which is a real shame. And I just did not, frankly, find what I learned in theory class very helpful as a composer. I think music theory has become much more analytical. I think it serves analysis better than anything else nowadays. Uh, rather than being a more practical theory for composers and musicians. And again, I think earlier, early music theory, I think, had a much more practical aim at it, um, particularly with study of counterpoint. And so I was dealing with all sorts of different experiments with harmony. I remember thinking, you know, well, I don't want to write a whole music. I would like to have some sense of consonance. Maybe I could have, I don't know, every instrument consonant with the bass, but not with each other. Or I could say, I'll allow whole tones to be consonant and minor sevens to be consonant, along with, you know, unison, third and fifth and sixth. But everything else is still the same. So different experiments, basically. And they all were good experiments, I'm glad I did them, but they never felt complete, really. They kind of felt, I don't know, uh, like transitionary or just not full conceptions of harmony, I suppose. So later on, we fast forward now to was it last year, I took a fantastic counterpoint class at this school by a professor named Tim Pack, really fantastic professor. And the way he taught counterpoint is a little different than what most counterpoint classes will do. Um, what he did was go really back to 15th century sources, 15th century sources, and taught with more of that kind of theory. Um, also a lot of the repertoire as well. And so he incorporated early modal theory, like a bit I mentioned earlier, as well as hexachoral uh, theory, and as well as the gamut. So these are already big differences in terms of conceiving of um, sort of diatonic pitch space, if you want to say. Um, and it was much more, it was a bit more practically oriented. We barely did any exercises. I love what he did. He would take a real piece of music with one of the voices missing, and he'd just tell you to write it like they could, basically. <laughs> which is great, because you're engaging with real music, by the way, as opposed to just writing out speeches, counterpoint exercises, mm -hmm. you know, forever and ever, which can be useful. Um, but having a more practical aim like that, I found to be great as a composer. And I'm actually I want to use this to make real music. You know, it's not just a theory exercise for me. And that 
happened to me just at the beginning, too, of my counseling uh, journeys in, in, in the home. And, um, but it was at that point, especially, I felt like there was a, there was a real reality of counseling for Christmas. Um, and my music had just become a little more, I guess, water had come on, so to speak. Um, and you're going to hear that in a little bit. So, moving on to more recent studies I've been doing on earlier forms of counseling, particularly in the 15th and 16th century, led me to learn about uh, improvised counseling. And this seems to be the, the main method that people practice counseling in the Middle Age and the Renaissance in particular, and even into the 18th century in certain parts of Europe like the Middle East. Um, it was a much, again, much more oral tradition. It was not just a lot of writing out exercises and someone singing a plain chant, regular values, to people improvising, creating counseling right then in real time. And very interested in how they did this. How do you learn to do that? And so there's a lot of pretty brand new research on the topic. Um, Peter Schubert is probably the best known name in that field, and he's a bit of in the older generation now, and there are younger generations of scholars that are really taking it to another level by actually teaching the practice itself in certain institutions. I know they've got something going on at the Stoic and Forum at Bengal, for instance. Um, Schubert's, I believe, still teaching in McGill and incorporating some imp improvisation into counseling classes. And I won't go into too much about the improvised. I'll talk more about improvisation a little later, still. But what these things do is that they get the knowledge much deeper into you when you actually have to do it physically instead of just writing something on a page. Most theory classes are, we're going to tell you a series of abstract theoretical rules, and we're going to have you just implement those rules in an exercise. But the way they learned counseling in, say, the 15th, 16th century was very different. They didn't learn abstract rules. They rather learned patterns, musical patterns, by heart, just as you would memorize melodic patterns by heart. And they would implement these patterns um, through practice of improvisation. So that's a very different um, way of going about it. And the importance of memory, I think, was really made very clear to me by a lovely book called We Hold Music and the Art of Memory by Marianne Bruce Burton. And she has a lovely chapter, uh, very well, more than a chapter, large section of the book on counterpoint pedagogy um, in the Middle Ages and early Renaissance. And she laid out that there were two main things that students, sing uh, singers, would learn. They would learn what notes are consonant with other notes throughout the whole gamut. So not just, you know, this C is consonant with this B, but this C is consonant with this B, and so forth. But that was throughout the whole sort of pitch spectrum. And they would also learn contrapuntal motion. So what is that? It's sort of like, how do I move from a third to a fifth? What type of motion? allow me to do that. If the tenor moves you know, by a fifth, and I'm at a fifth above the tenor, what can I do? You know, in that case, you can stay, and you can become a unison, or you can move up to where it be a third, you can flip a third, and so on. So you learn all these patterns that are governed by these abstract rules, but they don't want you to just learn the abstract rules. They want you to learn all the possible instantiations of those rules, so you can actually use them in real time. That's again getting the knowledge so much deeper into you than just having it sort of in this intellectual space. And that has a lot of implications for not only a musician, improviser, but also a composer. Because now these patterns, these, these are tools that are right at your fingertips. Right? You don't have to think it through to write everything out. It's more immediate. Let's see. I think at this point, I'll present the final piece of music um, for this talk, another piece that I wrote, that also has um, melodic influence from the lay. And it's a two-voice piece, so you're going to hear you know, what I've been doing with harmony. This is actually about a year old. Um, so a lot of the most recent research that I'm doing has yet to make it fully into my music. You'll hear a bit of it, but it's 
still some new ones sort of working through it. Um, but you'll definitely hear some of the things I'm talking about in the video. So at this point, I'd like to invite Greg. What?
dynamic and technical organization. Um, all these things are very different conceptions of the diatonic state than we have nowadays, for instance. Um, first of all, the gamut um, is not exactly a purely diatonic structure, like, like the modal theory earlier comes out of B natural and B flat, soft and all of these. Um, and this already adds a certain sort of flexibility to the tonal space that we can work within if you're working within a diatonic system um, than we have nowadays. So it's a different sort of conception. Um, I particularly like it because I also don't really like uh, diatonics very much, so it's nice to be avoiding it. Uh, the Guidonian hand is a really neat thing, a neat practice, and I first learned it, and again, it's make, just like the sort of improvisational practices, which is this is related to, it makes things more tactile, more physical, it takes music and music theory out of the intellect that is purely in the intellect and moving it more into the body. And you get a, sort of a more you know, physical, more visceral connection with music, and you can sort of feel you know, intervals in a sense, you can feel pitch space. And also hexachordal solmization. This was an interesting one for me. I remember first learning about hexachords and not understanding why they were important at all. Um, and this is many years ago. Then I got to you know, Ken Pax's Capricorn class. He was talking about hexachordal theory. It made more sense. And then I actually tried singing with hexachordal solmization, and then it really made sense. And it, a lot of these things I feel are only things you can really get a sense of when you start doing them yourself. I mean, I'll, I've been telling you about how I think they're great, but I don't think I can really convince you unless you try it for yourself. Um, I would certainly encourage anyone doing early music to try to engage with these things, because I do think it changes the way you perceive um, music in general, but you know, pitch space with a diatonic scale um, and modes, it, it changes the way you can hear them, and I think that would change the way you would perform them too. As a composer, I find it very useful because, like I said, it gives me a different way to think about melody and harmony. So particularly, hexachordal solmization, or theory, is the idea that basically you have this whole tone, whole tone, semitone, whole tone, whole tone structure that overlaps and it's within the diatonic scale. So if we had you know, a C major scale, we would have E and F, this is semitone, you know, sort of flanked by the whole tone, and then B and C is the other semitone that's flanked by the whole tone, and both of them fit into that hexachordal structure. So we have these hexachords that are sort of like overlapping. And you know, if you're writing diatonic music, if you're involved with diatonic music, that structure's always there. It doesn't matter what time period you're in. So you can sort of ignore it or not. Um, and this theory highlights that structure, that internal structure, which is smaller than an octave. And that may seem maybe too small, but an octave is really actually quite a large amount of space. There's a lot of notes. So the modes are thought of as octave species in certain ways. So there's a lot going on in an octave. And thinking in the space of an octave, like you might do in, more, in sort of modern solmization, I'm not going to say it's not helpful, but I personally found hexachordal solmization to be very helpful to sort of break up the octave, look at the internal structure of it, and sort of feel that internal structure of it. Because although you can feel unmovable though, which I do, um, nothing wrong with it, you do get a sense of intervals because they will change. So let's say if you're in a minor mode, it'll be do, re, me, instead of do, re, me. So you have all these different syllables for the semitone. But if you have hexachordal solmization, you have two sets of ones in uh, one syllable for the semitone, mi and fa and ha. And you always have that, no matter where you are, no matter what semitone. And I wasn't anticipating this when I began to practice using hexachordal solmization. But when you always associate the semitone with those two syllables, mi and fa, you really begin to perceive uh, semitones and whole tones clearly because of that simple association. It's no longer, you know, re, me, or do, la, or sol, me, for instance. It's always mi, fa. That's simplified it. And maybe you could say later repertoire, sexto, 
they come back and it becomes a bit useless. Maybe that's true, but that's not the kind of music I'm writing anyway. So it fits the kind of music I write. I write really dark songs too. And even in the 18th century, a lot of uh, teachers and composers were using hexachordal harmonization. It goes on quite late in music history, actually. So that's all I have to say for that. Um, a few final words about improvisation, which is something I mentioned a few times. Like I said at the beginning, I began my musical experiences on guitar improvising. And you know, I've since learned that that's just not a common thing in the classical music world anymore. When I found out in the early music world that, that it was a common thing, I was extremely excited because it meant I could find a place to improvise in the classical music tradition, which is the music I love. And I don't think it can be understated how fundamental improvisation was in earlier times in classical music. I think every, it seems like every musician would have eventually thought of it as the basis, as the basic skill for composing. And like I said earlier, improvisation really is just composition in real time because the same method you use to learn <coughs> improvisation, you do, you use in composition. I think this is made explicit few times throughout history, and a few is just stated. Um, I think Horace makes a point about this in his um, Counterpoint Treatise. A, a bit later, about 100 years later, a Portuguese composer and theorist named Giuseppe Lucano, um, who wrote a fantastic treatise that just recently translated by uh, Philip Cunningham, a treatise on improvised counterpoint in more than three voices, or even up to four voices, improvising up to four voices. Um, he makes a point near the end of this book that you know, if you're having trouble improvising counterpoint, just try composing out and writing it out because it's the same thing. It's just one you're doing orally, one you're doing literally. Um, so the practices you learn in improvisation transfer to composition, and why would you want to improvise? Again, engaging in more oral practices, doing more improvisatory practices, shifts the knowledge from the intellect sort of more into the body or more into the every part of you. When you have to commit something to memory like that, you know, you spit it back out, you know, by doing it instead of writing it, that changes the, how you know it, basically. It becomes like a second nature. It really feels like a foreign language. And so by doing all of this, engaging with all of these things, as a folk musician, improviser, and composer, I found all this stuff to be extremely useful. I, I feel now as a composer that I have a method to compose with, which a lot of composers don't. I think I've I had conversations with many people, other composers about this. Often the feeling is when I begin a new piece, I feel like I have to reinvent the wheel every time because I just don't have a clear method. I'm beginning to not feel like that anymore, which is great. I can write the music a lot faster, which is great for deadlines. And I feel like my results are more coherent and consistent as well. So I think that's all I have to say. Um, 
try to not label myself because I don't want to put myself into a box. You know, I talk a lot about my early influences. I have lots of other influences too, from the not classical music and the modern music. Um, I, I try to just say I like classical music and just leave it that open to whatever that means. You know, I realize you know, maybe I would say my music is more confident maybe than perhaps some other modern music. Not all, but a lot of what I think is um, very confident, especially younger composers' music. So I might just say I'm a classical composer and leave it at that.